Well, in our first lesson, we heard that Abram was bereft. He had no heir. He and his wife, Sarai, were childless. And so the Lord told Abram to look up and behold the stars and count them if he was able. If you care to count, there are about 9,000 stars visible in the night sky. Standing in any one place, depending on conditions, you might pick out 2,600 to 4,500 stars. Various ones will be lost to the naked eye around the horizon. So let's say that we could look up as Abram did and try to count what we see and that we could count maybe 3,000 stars or even just a few hundred before we give up because neck cramps. The precise number is uh, less important. The point is that it was an overwhelming and overflowing promise to Abram. God's word must have provided strong assurance in those days. The scripture says that Abram believed what he was told. But what he did not know that we can add today was that when he was looking up at the stars, he was also looking at galaxies. He just didn't know it. With very few exceptions, you don't see a galaxy in the night sky with the naked eye. It only registers as a faint smudge. Its brightness is diffused over a large area. The mind quickly learns to ignore this and sort past it, looking for the brighter objects. A supreme irony, then, for science provides us with the very rough average that each galaxy could hold about a hundred billion stars. It would seem that on the way to counting a few of the brightest promises out of the many thousands of blessings that we can see, we miss the many billions of blessings that we simply let fade from view. Abram was 78 on that night. He had seen some stuff. His eyes weren't what they used to be. Abram and Sarai knew how things work, how people work, how their promises can come to nothing. Though Abram was not yet Abraham and Sarai was not yet Sarah, Though Abram would not fully enter into covenant with God and be circumcised for another 21 years, though he would not see his son Isaac brought into the world until he had reached the age of 100, even so, he beheld the enormity of the created order on that night and was cheered. And this is just a little different from how we're living now, right? Recently, I was in a Zoom meeting. I put my hand up so that I could be acknowledged to speak, and about a minute passed. Someone got nervous and sent me a direct message. I don't think the chair sees your hand. I wrote back, I'm playing the long game. <laughs> Well, in hindsight, I, although I knew what I was doing, it most certainly was not playing the long game. I expected to be recognized within the next 60 seconds. And in the same way, on Ash Wednesday, I found myself in a drive through line after the evening service. I spent five minutes waiting at the window before being acknowledged. The smallest thing imaginable, right? And I tell you, I confess, the aggrieved sighs that poured out of me as I waited, <laughs> only moments before I had led this congregation in a corporate confession that specifically talked about the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. Although I had spoken those words correctly from the book,
was not alive to them, not choosing awareness, not willing to take in and digest, not this particular time. I was too late in the day, and I'd done too much. I was just world-weary, sitting in a warm car with billions of blessings twinkling overhead. If the start of Lent is a confession against pride, hypocrisy, and impatience, then the rest of Lent is about getting brave and specific with those sins, seeing them at work within us as they wage war and sow chaos. If Ash Wednesday is about naming the brokenness of the human condition, then the rest of this holy season is about recentering ourselves in Christ and resting in godly wholeness, where we find humility, honesty, and patience we would not otherwise know we possess. Jesus, as always, is the ultimate model and friend. Time and again, he is accosted by big crowds of people who are hungry and sick. Time and again, he is confronted by various authorities who want to trick him and try him. But we say God is love. And because God is love, and because God does not withhold love from what God has made, and because God longs to teach us how to love one another, Jesus' response to the world is consistently, honestly, patient. Patiently honest. These days we have instantaneous feedback about everything to an absurd degree. We have forgotten a good deal of what it means to wait, of what it means to hear and anticipate and linger over a promise or even a confession. We've forgotten what it's like to sit and listen and stay connected long enough to start to really hear and see nuance and character and color of what it's like to receive a word and digest it thoroughly before going on to the next thing. As though we could will the sun to rise or make the tide come in any faster. Our timing is not God's timing. We seem to fear the silence, the long pause, the waiting, the stretches of so-called unproductive time. We seem to spurn the quiet prayer for patience. We think of silence as gaps or absences, spaces without meaning or purpose. Abram heard God's promise in his advanced age. And he did not see the fulfillment of that promise for 22 years. The evidence of his blessing was just overhead every night. He only had to look up and behold and lose himself in the counting. The promise and the blessing, they were not only above, they were all around in every direction and underfoot. This was, in fact, the second time that Abram received this same promise, not only of descendants, but also of land. For the Lord had already come to Abram at a crucial moment, and the Lord said, Raise your eyes now, Abram. Raise your eyes now, and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. 
I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can be counted. So rise up, Abram, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. A promise and a blessing. A promise of abundant, overflowing, divine generosity. Blessing that would belong to Abraham and Sarah and their generations and would extend far beyond the limits of their dimmed vision.